Okay, so thank you and uh, welcome back everyone or hello to those who join us now. So uh, yes, I, I want to uh, give a little presentation on a YouTube channel I've been running for a while now. So uh, let me start by describing uh, the channel. So you see here the, the, the link, so feel free to have a look at it if uh, uh, if you may be bored at some time in my presentation. So I created this YouTube channel in, uh, well, just about nine years ago in December 2012, in the aim to host some videos I used in articles I'm occasionally writing for, uh, for an outreach website, which is uh, managed by uh, the French CNRS called uh, Image de Mathematique, Images of Mathematics. So I've been uh, since then writing one or two articles uh, approximately each year and some of those use simulations and uh, it was somehow technically easier to just put these simulations on YouTube which manages compression and uh, all kinds of technical things. So in April this year, in the beginning of April, the channel had had about 60,000 views. So if you make the computation, something like, I guess, 20 views a day. And I had in all put about 40 videos. So that was uh, eight months ago. Uh, what's the situation now? So uh, here is a, a snapshot of my uh, YouTube studio page. So you see that uh, the channel has gotten in the last year uh, a bit over 8 million views and I have now 25 on Sunday I just reached 25,000 subscribers so uh, that was a nice milestone and uh, in the meantime I've, I've done about 300 videos on that channel. So of course as YouTube channels go you, you find channels that have way more views and subscribers than that but still it's a big difference. So, so what happened? Well, uh, the first thing that happened was that one morning in early, uh, April, I more or less by chance uh, realized that uh, I had lots of comments on my on my channel. I almost didn't uh, note it because I don't usually check my channel so often, but there was uh, one tab in my browser open on a, on a YouTube video and there was a little 88 written there that told me actually there had been 88 comments on a couple of my videos. So uh, here's one of the videos. I hope uh, with streaming it uh, it is uh, it is visible. So uh, that's a video I use. Uh, I like to use when I teach uh, stochastic processes or Markov chains. And it's uh, I call it an Ehrenfest model, although the Ehrenfest model is a simplified uh, mathematical model for that. But you see, you have uh, you start if I if I go back in the simulation, you start with uh, 200 particles in one uh, container, and uh, they just move without interacting. They just bounce on the walls, and gradually you have more and more particles on the right side, and it tends to equilibrate. So, it's a nice simulation to talk about things like reversibility versus irreversibility. So the dynamics here is microscopically reversible. So if you were to change, to turn all particles at some point in time, they would go back to the initial state. Uh, but in practice, it's very unlikely to see that. So there's a notion of recurrence time, you can talk about entropy and so on. And I've uh, written here a few uh, comments which gave me a clue as to uh, what had happened. So, so the first one, uh, the first comment here suggested that there seemed to be something going on on YouTube with uh, science simulation videos getting more popular. So it didn't just happen to me, it happened to, to other people as well. In the beginning, I thought that maybe at YouTube they had uh, tweaked their algorithm. So it's the algorithm that gives you suggestions of videos to see when you when you connect to your YouTube page, but it's quite possible that it only was a, a coincidence. So we will come back to that. Uh, the second comment actually uh, also is a little joke uh, on, on the compression because that was an old video at a very low resolution and uh, uh, YouTube has this nasty habit of compressing 
videos which are have a low resolution more and more and uh, so the simulation was not actually as nice as what you hopefully see now uh, here is another video that also uh, that had even more views i i think at, at some point it's even simpler so that is a billiard in a circle so it shows I think it was 500 particles represented by little velocity vectors bouncing in a circle. So uh, the billiards in the circle are not at all chaotic. It's a perfectly regular integrable system, but still you see a little bit of the dispersion because the particles started with different velocities and uh, you see that this set of particles gradually spreads a little bit. And so there were a couple more uh, comments that uh, okay gave me the hint that uh, that had something to do with the algorithm. Uh, there were also a number of uh, comments actually that uh, seemed to show that that people were a bit frustrated because uh, actually the video stops just short of uh, the whole set uh, becoming something close to a circle. So, so. What did I do next? So the first thing was, of course, I, I don't like people to be unhappy if, if I can help it in any way. So, so the first thing I, I did was to make a longer version of this video. And uh, then I, I told uh, uh, the story to a few colleagues. They uh, gave me a few suggestions of other nice things to simulate. I will come back to that also. Uh, and and shortly afterwards, I, I got a comment saying, why don't you upload in higher resolution? So the thing was, when I did the first videos nine years ago, uh, the standards were different, computer was, was slower, so I, uh, I had a resolution maybe of 360 points or something like that. Now the standard is, uh, is higher than that, at least twice or maybe uh, three, four times as much. So that, that was a good suggestion. I started by uh, uploading videos in, in higher resolution. And uh, a bit later, I got a suggestion to add music to the video. So when I saw that, I thought, I don't know how to do that. I mean, I'm not able to uh, compose music myself, and I know almost nothing about audio editing or, you know, using music from some databases. You're never sure about uh, copyright infringements and things like that. But I rather soon found out that actually on YouTube you have something called the audio library, which has a large number of tracks, uh, several thousand, I believe there are of a very different length from a few seconds to uh, the longest or maybe half an hour or something like that. And it's with a little bit of practice, very easy to navigate and to find tracks. And once you put your video on YouTube, you will just select a track and uh, you let YouTube edit. So, so I, I started doing that. Uh, quite a bit later, I started doing shorts, so I will come back to those. So those are actually videos that are, as the name suggests, not very long, so shorter than a minute. They have a special format, but they they are maybe uh, uh, diffused in, in a different way, so uh, there are different channels, and, and it helps spreading uh, your, uh, your videos. And I also got a comment about using a color scheme. So at the beginning, I used some, I don't even remember where I found it, but there was some uh, uh, library that allowed to, uh, to translate uh, uh, colors in, uh, there's a color coding called HSV. So it's use saturation, uh, uh, and uh, uh, HSL and the luminosity, and uh, you can translate it in RGB, and I used that. So it's basically what is called JET. And some people said that uh, that for several reasons it wasn't a good color scheme. So uh, because uh, for for one, it is not uh, uh, so it's not visually uniform, not perceptually uniform. So. If you would have, uh, say, yellow and blue particles on a on a white background, you won't see the yellow so much, and on a black background, you won't see the blue so much. So, 
I took a while doing that, but finally I, I found uh, how, how to do it. So there were helpful comments uh, with that. So uh, the image you see here is uh, uh, an example of a color scheme called Inferno, which is quite nice. And there are a few others. And I kept getting lots of suggestions on uh, uh, well, different uh, physical systems to, to simulate and different effects and uh, to simulate and so on. So I started doing that on a very regular basis and uh, the channel just kept uh, growing from there. So what uh, are the main themes of the videos on my channel? Uh, broadly speaking, you can uh, divide the, the videos in two categories. So there are particle and wave uh, or PDE simulations. So the particle simulations started mostly with uh, uh, regular versus chaotic billiards. So how, when you change the shape of the domain, the dynamics changes. Uh, later, I did quite a few on the illumination problem. I will tell you more about that a bit later. Uh, some use translation surfaces, so these are mathematical objects that you obtain when you take a polygon in the plane and you identify certain sides. So, for instance, if you start with a rectangle or square, you will obtain uh, topologically a torus, but if you do it with other shapes, you obtain uh, sometimes more interesting uh, things like surfaces of higher genus. Uh, I did uh, quite a lot of statistics on Sinai billiards. So these are billiards with circular scatterers, and uh, you can look at things like uh, collision uh, statistics, free path statistics, and so on. And uh, quite recently, I started doing also some molecular dynamics. So I, I showed one example in my talk on, on Monday. So particles interacting with, for instance, uh, Lemma Jones potential. The, wave or partial differential equation simulations are mostly on the wave equation, so the simple linear hyperbolic one-dimensional wave equation. And they show uh, physical phenomena such as refraction when you pass from one medium to another one with a different speed of propagation. Diffraction, that's when a wave hits an obstacle. Uh, the effect of fractal domains. The picture here shows something that you can view as Anderson localization, meaning that you have a wave arriving on obstacles which are randomized. So the position and radius of these obstacles is Same random. Oh, and that, yeah. and yeah. that uh, decreases the, yeah, the speed of preparation. So uh, we have some interference. Hello? We seem to, but yeah. I don't know where uh, it comes from. Hello, dear professor. So is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm waiting here. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Sorry, one of the participants was not muted and probably on the phone. Okay, so no, <laughs> no problem. So, so let's continue. So, uh, um, yes, Anderson localization, I was telling, is a phenomenon where waves tend to uh, stop propagating in a random medium. Uh, I will come back to these wave protection things. Uh, there was invisibility cloaks, uh, resonators. Uh, so all this was uh, is for the wave equation. Then I also made some simulations for the heat equation and for Schrodinger's equation. All right. So uh, what uh, what are the most viewed uh, videos? So here uh, that's my top ten. So that's from maybe ten days ago. But I think the uh, the list has not changed uh, since then. So uh, what you see here. The third column here from the right is the number of views. So you see the most uh, viewed video has uh, 1.8 million views. And uh, you also see the number of comments, uh, number of likes. So, okay, I should say that only a few videos have, have that many views. So most of them have maybe between one and, uh, and a couple thousand views. I didn't try to plot the number of videos uh, 
were in a, with a certain number of views. Maybe there's some interesting scaling laws there, there like for earthquakes, I don't know. But uh, what, what happens, you can see it on this graphic here. Uh, so, so that uh, is the number of views per day for the five most uh, popular videos uh, as, uh, as time goes on. So you, you have this uh, funny phenomenon that every once in a while one video gets a lot of views and what I've been told is that it's related to how the YouTube uh, algorithm works when it suggests videos. So somehow it detects how many uh, clicks and uh, maybe also how many likes and comments the video has in a certain period of time. And when this number is larger, then the video tends to be suggested to more people. So you have some kind of positive feedback there, which occasionally uh, uh, just creates some kind of, of avalanche phenomenon. So what, what happens is every now and then one video uh, gets more and more views. And as you see here, there you have some something like an exponential increase. And, and then it reaches the point where more and more people see the video and fewer and fewer people actually are interested in that video. So the proportion of people uh, looking at it drops and, and then the, the peak goes down again. But sometimes, you know, there are some kind of resurgences there like resonances. So the, the orange curve had the first peak in mid-April and the later one in mid-June. And there was a second one in uh, late June and a very large peak here in, uh, I think it was beginning of September and so on and so forth. So uh, let me now tell you a little bit about a few of, of these videos. So that was one of the first that, uh, that had uh, quite a lot of uh, success. And uh, that one was actually suggested to me by, by a colleague, by Luc Hilleret, when I first talked about, uh, told him about this uh, unusual success of, of my channel. Uh, and uh, the story is, is like this. So uh, David, uh, sorry, David Vicente is a, is a former PhD student from, uh, from our institute who now were, is teaching at, at a high school but he's still doing some mathematics. And he wrote a couple of uh, papers with Yves Collin Verdier, who is a well-known French mathematician and also Luc's former thesis advisor. And so what they did is they, they looked at uh, a wave expanding in a domain like an ellipse. And uh, it's really in the ideal situation of geometric optics. So it expands as a circle but then uh, it is reflected off the sides. And uh, okay, you can see here what kind of, uh, of dynamics you get. And it, uh, it can get rather complicated. So you get these shapes and I, I guess uh, somehow the, the visuals have something, uh, something uh, maybe a bit hypnotizing or at least something pleasing to the eye. You can also see things or on the, uh, you can actually guess where the focal points of the ellipse are because you have this property that a trajectory that once crosses a focal point will actually keep crossing those focal points uh, uh, in a <coughs> alternatively uh, all the time. And uh, so what, what uh, Eve and David showed is that for this kind of billiard, the total length of the curve grows linearly on average. So it grows proportionally to time with uh, some oscillations around it. And it's actually a quite, uh, there, there's an, uh, an elementary version and there's a very advanced version based on things like uh, stationary phase approximation. So uh, does this always happen? Well, there's one exception. It's when you start on a focal point and that's a thing if you have uh, heard about uh, conical sections uh, at some point at school, you, you may know actually when you start in a focal point, you will converge to the other focal point. And one property of an ellipse is that the sum of the distances to the two foci is uh, constant. And that also means that the travel time is constant. So you get this very simple uh, motion. 
which uh, actually this uh, simulation also had uh, quite some, su some success. Right, so uh, what happened after that is that uh, several commenters said that's very nice, but there's no interference here. So can you do the same simulation and show interference? So I thought, sure, why not? I, I know the wave equation. I had some uh, uh, experience in, uh, in uh, simulating the heat equation and parabolic equations. So uh, I thought I could do the wave equation as well. And uh, I was able to do it. It was a little bit harder than I first expected, but, but it worked. So for instance, here you, uh, you have a wave uh, just hitting a simple obstacle and you have some uh, rather nice uh, diffraction phenomena. Uh, what happened at some point is that a viewer asked me if I can also simulate uh, the propagation of heat. And I thought, sure, that is even easier. Uh, the heat equation is much more stable, but it's also more boring because uh, basically in the heat equation, the heat will just go everywhere and uh, will end up with just a completely homogeneous heat distribution. So that's why I, I started doing uh, simulations with the heat equation, but using uh, fractal boundaries, because I, I knew that in that case, uh, the motion is more interesting and you can get things like, uh, uh, I mean, that's related to the harmonic measure to the first hitting location of Brownian motion of, of these things. So I, I did some simulations with, with fractals. So, uh, here is a, is a sequence of simulations with a, with a increasing uh, approximations of, of the Sierpinski carpet. So uh, let me jump to level three here. And what happens is that as uh, the, the level of the, the number of levels of the fractal increases, actually the wave propagates more and more slowly. And so if I jump to level four, uh, you will uh, actually see that the wave has much more difficulty penetrating the fractal structure. And uh, so the fractal structure actually has an insulating effect. And I, I have heard once a talk about some people building uh, sound insulation based on such kind of approximately fractal structure. Now, there, uh, there was one comment I I show you here, and uh, this comment, what's remarkable about it is that the comment itself has 6.7k likes, so it has 6,700 likes, which is unusual. And the comment was, and now you understand why mangroves are important for coastline. So uh, what are mangroves? So the name is used both for a particular tree and for an ecosystem, for a type of vegetation you find on certain coasts with uh, trees or maybe some kind of shrubs that have a very complicated fractal-like structure. They're actually very efficient at, okay, maybe not stopping uh, tsunamis, but uh, at least uh, stopping storms and high waves. So, and that led to a uh, large number of simulations uh, because people rightfully asked, uh, is the fractal structure necessary? What if you just put a regular grid of obstacles? Uh, what if you put a random grid of obstacles? That kind of thing. Right, so if I move to the, my next example, that one uh, is on uh, the working of the parabolic antenna, or maybe one should say parabolic reflector. And uh, that is also something I, I probably learned that at high school, but I'm not sure nowadays, at least in France, uh, in high school, uh, uh, the pupils don't learn about conical sections anymore, unfortunately. But it, it tells you how, uh, you know, satellite dishes work. So here you have a, a source, which is on, on the focal point at the left. So it emits like uh, just uh, in a second, it will emit a circular wave. And if you follow this wave, part is reflected and the property of the par parabolic shape here is that the reflected part becomes a linear wave, a planar wave in 3D. 
And it's, it travels to uh, the other side and actually the, the second reflector can be much further apart because you have a planar wave, you have little dispersion. So almost all the energy uh, is kept and then it's uh, focused again, hence the name on the second focal point and uh, you get a good reception of, of the signal. So uh, the version I'm showing you here is, uh, is not the, the one with the most views. Uh, it's a remake I did later with a different color scheme and that I like better somehow because there's less numerical dispersion here. Uh, moving on, uh, that simulation here is about, if you wish, a kind of Sinai billiard. So it's about a trajectory here, as you have seen, which is, uh, uh, reflected off a certain number of circular scatterers. So think of it as a laser beam. And uh, I'm going to very slowly change the angle you see at the, uh, at the bottom left here and, and like something like the ninth or tenth decimal place. And uh, we'll see what happens. So at the beginning, it's not so impressive, but at some point we will hit a situation where uh, the small change uh, in the angle causes larger and larger changes in the uh, in the exit angle. And what I did is that I uh, just stop the simulation for a short time whenever the number of reflections in, uh, is larger than 50, I believe it was. So that gives you a visual uh, representation of what is called the, what uh, Edward Lawrence called the butterfly effect. So it's sensitive dependence on initial condition. While changing very slightly the initial angle, you can have a very large effect. Uh, the nice thing was that actually uh, another YouTube channel called the Action Lab saw that that video. The, the people uh, were running that channel and they made a real life uh, experiment with that. Okay, what's a little bit uh, uh, disappointing is that actually in real life, your laser beam is not that, uh, uh, I mean, it's not that one dimensional and you get so much dispersion that you can't really see the effect like that, but uh, still it's, it's nice to see. And um, uh, another example of simulations that, uh, that are quite uh, quite popular on my channel are related to the illumination problem. So uh, the illumination problem is uh, an abstract mathematical problem, which was, I think, uh, invented in the 1950s, where you ask if you have uh, a room, uh, so we are in 2D, so a two-dimensional room with perfectly reflecting walls, is it possible to construct the room in such a way that a single light source can never light the whole room. Of course, if the room is convex, you don't even need reflecting walls. You will always be uh, able to illuminate the whole room. But uh, what if the room is not convex? And, and that here is a, a first example that was found by Roger Penrose. And uh, it's made of four arcs of ellipses and a few straight lines. And uh, what it uses, you see there, there are these mushrooms here and the tips of the mushrooms are at the focal points of, uh, of the upper, upper and lower ellipse. And it uses the property that whenever a, a trajectory or, or a beam uh, passes between to the two focal points, it will always pass between them. And if it passes outside, it will always pass outside. And in that way, you can actually quite easily see that you will never be able to uh, illuminate the whole room. And then there are other solutions uh, due to Tokarski in particular, where the rooms are actually polygons that are also quite nice to look at. All right, so uh, let me tell you a little bit uh, about how I make these videos. So uh, I code them in C uh, with some OpenGL libraries. So, well, the, the main reason, maybe not the best one, is that C is a language I learned a long time ago and I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, familiar with it. So I, it's the language I think I, I know best. And 
uh, but it also it has uh, it has some advantages so it's a compiled language so it's fast so especially the wave equations are pretty heavy on computation time so so it's, it's rather fast and also c is very stable actually in some of my code i uh, I used a code I originally wrote. Uh, it was even before my PhD. It was in my master thesis, and that was in the 90s. So there was some 30 years old code which still runs today. So, uh, okay, the code is expanded. So right now I can simulate these uh, different systems and 30 to 40 different geometries with different boundary conditions, such as periodic, uh, Dirichlet, uh, absorbing, and so on, different color schemes. Uh, the code is available on GitHub because I, I think it's important to have uh, open access to uh, uh, open source. And a certain number of people, I, I had some feedback of people who are using and uh, trying to improve that code, so that's nice. Uh, the particle simulations with uh, this way of doing them, I can usually uh, render in real time. So for a two minutes video, I, I can compute it in two minutes and even less, unless I use a large number of particles. The wave simulations are usually slower because I use this method of finite differences. So I discretize the Laplacian and if you make the computation, it's uh, I mean, there are like one million pixels in each image, and I do many iterations for one image and 25 images for one second, so it adds up. Uh, but uh, the numerical scheme I use is really something completely standard, so I didn't, uh, I didn't invent anything there. So, uh, so I just looked up what. Uh, uh, what I found in the literature and, uh, and it, it works very nicely. Uh, a colleague, Marco Mancini, uh, uh, helped me quite a lot in accelerating the code. So there are ways of improving the code by, uh, by how it has to do with how you compile it, how you manage the, the loops, the innermost loop, the one that you execute a huge number of times. So it, it really pays to uh, improve that. Uh, I contacted Marco initially because I had heard about GPU uh, computation and I and actually he he knows how to do that. So he has a version uh, working on a, on a GPU, uh, but it still has some issues related to uh, to, to graphics. Uh, so I'm mostly using a simpler parallelization, which is called OpenMP. So it's a way to uh, spread the computation time on uh, the, if you have several cores on, on your computer, so it, it makes quite a difference. Now let's look at some statistics. So on the YouTube channel, I have access to a number of statistics. I don't really know how reliable these are because, for instance, some statistics are about age and I I don't remember telling uh, YouTube my age. Maybe I did, I just don't remember. So I, I don't know really how the data is collected, how many people give these informations. This one is about uh, the country. So, so that is probably quite reliable because it looks at the IP number. And okay, not surprisingly, uh, the most viewers come from the United States. That's, uh, I mean, uh, the US have a large population and people are very well connected there. Uh, afterwards, uh, there are a number of European countries, Germany, UK, uh, France, uh, Italy, uh, that are among the largest uh, European countries. So no surprise there either. And then you have uh, Brazil, India, Canada. And as you see on the curves, it's uh, the distribution between countries uh, is rather stable. Now, another statistic we can look at is the age of viewers. And as I said, I'm not sure how reliable these data are. So the actually the majority of viewers are either in the category 18 to 24 years. So uh, I think of them as having the age of, of uh, our students at, at university. And and the others have uh, age 25, 34, so maybe 
like PhD students and a little bit older. Uh, interestingly, these two uh, peaks kind of interchange their height uh, from time to time. So for a long time at the beginning, the 1824 peak was higher. And, and then it, it was the uh, 2434, and then it's, it switched back uh, several times. There's one statistic uh, I have to say, which is uh, a little bit uh, disappointing, which is the gender statistics. So according to YouTube, uh, only about 5% of the viewers are, are women. Now, again, uh, there might be quite some bias because there could be factors like maybe women are less likely to give, to tell YouTube their age. So uh, maybe there are many uh, uh, people YouTube don't adjust uh, all their, their gender. So maybe YouTube just does, doesn't know uh, the gender of these people. Uh, maybe it's also that uh, women tend more to have a life and not spend their time on, on the internet. I, I don't know. Uh, but still, if you, uh, you're somehow involved in, uh, in science outreach, at some point you hit the question of why uh, women seem to be underrepresented in the sciences. And there are, there are a number of reasons which are put forward. So it can have to do with education, with uh, you know, what kind of toys a child has. It can have to do with social pressure. Uh, it can have to do with career and uh, family planning, uh, which is maybe more difficult for women. Uh, it may have to do with a lack of self-confidence, but that probably is then a consequence of one of, of these, uh, these, other, uh, uh, these other reasons. So when, uh, when you do outreach, uh, one thing, I mean, it's a difficult problem. What is sure, I mean, I know for sure I have many female colleagues and co-workers and I, I know they're all uh, really accomplished scientists. So it's not at all a thing about women not uh, being uh, able to, to do good science. Uh, so yeah, what can you do uh, uh, to mitigate these different things? So if at least there, there are different uh, mechanisms in place, but if, for instance, you do outreach, a good thing to keep in mind is that you should try uh, not to give the impression that science has always been uh, produced mainly by, uh, by men. So, for instance, a couple or uh, three, four years ago, I gave a talk at a high school in a small town near Orléans. Uh, it was a uh, there were two people talking then, there were over 100 uh, students, so it was really nice. And I gave a talk about quantum mechanics and some links to current research and stochastic PDEs. And uh, when preparing the talk, I realized that I was mentioning Schrödinger, I was mentioning uh, Feynman, I was mentioning Martin Heirer as a, a recent worker on, on SPDEs, but uh, I didn't mention any women. So what I did is uh, actually I put a slide at the end just to show that there are nowadays many women working on SPD. So I put uh, uh, so uh, pictures of people like uh, Marta Sansole and, uh, and, uh, and Sandra Cherai and many other women who are really successful in working on SPDEs. And just to tell them that, uh, you know, uh, there are also women doing that and they are successful at it. All right, so um, a word on the comments I get for uh, in this video. So I get a lot of comments. I try to react to as many of them as I can, but I can't react to all of them. Uh, here are just some <coughs> examples. So uh, what I got a lot of at the beginning uh, is this comment, why am I getting these uh, in my recommendations? So. Uh, that's actually, I understood, a sign of the YouTube algorithm doing its thing. So uh, it typically appears when one video uh, gets very popular and more and more people get recommendations. And at some point, it reaches people who actually are not really interested in that. So they ask this question. But I, I got it a lot at the beginning, and I'm getting it less and less. So it seems to be a sign that the algorithm is improving uh, the way it works. Uh, 
The second comment I, I get quite a lot is something like, I have no idea what this is, but I like it. So that's already a comment I, I, I like as someone doing outreach because it shows, well, we, let, let's, let's not lie. We, we know that there are lots of people who actually uh, hate mathematics and science and suffered a lot and uh, maybe even developed some kind of pho phobia of uh, mathematics. And they believe that you know, the teacher, they never understood what he did and uh, mathematics is just not for me. And if you just can show these people that mathematics or science can produce beautiful pictures, of course, it will maybe not cure them from their uh, fear of mathematics, but maybe it's a first step just to, uh, to, to uh, change that attitude. Then I, I get quite a lot of comments on uh, just saying that it's uh, it's beautiful, it's nice uh, to see. I get uh, praise on the choices of music as well, and uh, that's of course nice. Uh, one type of comment I really like, I get this occasionally. It's from people who say that they uh, that the, some of these simulations should be used in lectures, or even uh, that they are going to use it in the in lecture. So. That is nice because when I was a student, I, I did spend some time making simulations, but computers were really by far not as powerful as nowadays. So some of the simulations I now do in half an hour on my little laptop, I couldn't have done in, in several weeks on, uh, uh, on workstations uh, 20 years ago. So if these uh, videos help people illustrate their lecture, their, that's of course very nice. Then I, I also get a lot, a lot of comments on, okay, what happens if you change this or that parameter? And uh, or can you make a version of the simulation where you change uh, this and that? And it's not always possible to, to uh, implement all these suggestions, but I try doing it as much as possible. And, it has really led to new ideas of simulation. So many of the things I, I did uh, come from uh, viewer suggestions. Then uh, I also get really uh, comments that show me at, that some people uh, look at these simulations really uh, in detail. Like they say, I noticed that at one minute, 20, 28 seconds, this and that happens. Sometimes they notice things I didn't notice when I, made the simulation. For instance, I made these simulations on, on uh, Sinai billiards or Lorentz gases with uh, uh, circum circular obstacles. And there's the finite and the infinite horizon case. Uh, so uh, the distinction is, can you have paths of arbitrary length or not? So I started with small obstacles and in infinite horizon, and then I, made a simulation which I thought was finite horizon, but actually I made a mistake. And at some point in the video, the particle is just making a huge jump and uh, some uh, few people noticed that. So people really look, some people at least look very carefully at these simulations. Uh, I also get a lot of comments saying, uh, ah, actually your simulation illustrates this particular phenomenon in physics or chemistry and so on. And actually the type of comment I like best, and that is really important when you do outreach is comments that just say that uh, my video made them think. And that's really, it's a nice thing to uh, entertain people, to show them, uh, nice images, uh, uh, maybe they can watch them just to, to relax and so on. But it's even better if uh, <clears throat> it actually starts a, a thinking process. So that people really view the video and not just take it at a point value, but uh, start thinking about implications or variants or phenomena that are related to the video. Okay, um, why uh, do I keep doing this? I've been doing that now for eight months and um, I, I, I'm not gonna lie, I, I'm spending some time uh, with this channel. 
So, well, first of all, I really believe that science outreach is important. And uh, well, I think you will all agree that science is important in our lives. So uh, there's a lot of science going on. We are surrounded by technology. Technology is based on science. Uh, we are facing challenges, uh, you know, related to climate uh, change and uh, epidemics and so on and so forth. And uh, I'm sure that science is going to be a major player in dealing with these, uh, these uh, things. Uh, so I, I really believe it's important that many people understand at least partly science. So it doesn't mean that everyone has to be a rocket scientist. But on the other hand, uh, I think it's not sufficient that just scientists understand science. So there has to be some middle ground. And the good thing about science is that it's, uh, it's not occult. It's not like some religions where you have to, you know, follow some uh, complicated intronization uh, uh, ceremony and then you get access to knowledge. I mean, the knowledge is there. You just have to, uh, it may be hard to, uh, to acquire the, the knowledge, but it's, it's not hidden. Also, uh, I have the impression that uh, there has been uh, in the last few years uh, a confidence crisis in science, which is fueled by different things. So you may have heard about the reproducibility crisis. So people uh, realizing that many experiments actually uh, cannot be reproduced because Maybe they were done in a sloppy way, or maybe the parameters were not uh, recorded, or uh, things like that. There are lots of uh, publicized cases of scientific misconduct, you know, such as plagiarism and uh, data fabrication and so on. There are blogs like Retraction Watch uh, and so on uh, that talk about these things. Uh, predatory publishers and conferences. So uh, we all get all these invitations to uh, publish or to come to conference when actually the people organizing those are just interested in collecting the, the fees. Uh, also, uh, the political agenda of some people who are actually uh, interested in uh, people doubting uh, scientific, scientific evidence. There are some conspiracy theories. So. Uh, all these things mean that maybe part of, uh, of the world population uh, are, have maybe a tendency to doubt how uh, reliable science is. And in a way, uh, it is good to doubt. But of course, uh, these phenomena don't mean that all science is, is bad. Actually, uh, a big part of science is, is really uh, uh, very... Uh, accurate and, and, and well done, but it's really important that people can form their own opinion about these things. So uh, it doesn't mean that all scientists should do outreach, but it means that at least a fair proportion, proportion of uh, scientists should, I think, spend some time in uh, explaining uh, the science they do. Okay, now having said that, uh, this confidence crisis thing is not new. And I really recommend that you uh, go have a look at this interview by Isaac Asimov, who is one of my favorite uh, science fiction authors, which was made in 88. And uh, where he talks about uh, rationalism, why he thinks it's important and so on. And uh, it's really, uh, very interesting what he says, and he says many things I've just said now. So uh, apparently these things are, may, maybe they, they are kind of periodic, maybe they, they come and go, maybe they're always there. I, I don't know. Uh, okay, uh, another simple reason why I keep doing this is that uh, obviously there's a demand. I mean, there are a, a number of people looking at my videos, uh, uh, seems to suggest that. So, and we've seen a little bit uh, on the statistics I've shown before. Okay, I don't really know who my audience is, but I have some hints from the statistics from the comments. So, uh, some of them are uh, probably uh, 
you know, school children, uh, students who uh, look at that just to, okay, for entertainment or maybe to, to find things, uh, explanations about some things they, they learned uh, during the lectures. Uh, also, I think a fair proportion of them are people who uh, may, maybe had uh, uh, some education in science, but then they found a job where they use very little of the mathematics or physics they, they learned at school, but they are still interested and they, they want to be kept informed and they, so they turn to different sources like, uh, like, like books and, uh, and maybe, uh, maybe some films, but more and more they turn to uh, sources like the internet, like YouTube. Uh, and also uh, part of the audience uh, clearly are people who are really professional scientists and they often have very, uh, very uh, interesting comments on, on this. And well, of course, uh, I keep also doing it. I, I would have stopped a long time ago if it wasn't uh, actually fun to, to do these things. So uh, maybe some of you now are interested in uh, uh, creating your own YouTube channel or blog or whatever uh, uh, outreach activity. And uh, so do I have any recommendations? Well, my experience is not so uh, huge, but, uh, but okay, I, a, few, uh, a few hints of what could help uh, having, uh, having success on the things like a YouTube channel. It seems to be important to keep a regular schedule when you publish. So if you put two uh, videos one week and then nothing for, for three weeks, it probably won't really help. So I early on, because I uh, received so many suggest uh, suggestions, I actually decided to publish one video every day, which is a lot, I, I, I agree. But my software allows me to produce uh, the, the videos rather quickly. So it, that's probably not necessary, but uh, if you go to uh, channels of people doing outreach, they usually publish on a schedule like maybe once a week or twice a week or twice a month or things like that. So that seems to help because it is related to this, how the YouTube algorithm works. Uh, it seems that uh, titles and uh, thumbnails are important because uh, a nice uh, thumbnail will attract more people. Uh, also, the way you choose your title can have uh, an impact. Now, I, I'm a little bit uh, careful with that because, I, of course, you could choose some clickbait like, you know, uh, the truth they don't want you to know about uh, the CIA and Elvis Presley staging the moon landing in Bielefeld or something like that. Uh, but if then uh, your video doesn't really keep the promise, uh, it may be not such a good uh, scheme after all. Uh, it seems that it's also uh, uh, good to really react to comments because, uh, so I, I don't know if the algorithm keeps track of that, but if you, try to regularly reply to comments, you will at least get a closer relationship to, uh, to the viewers. And uh, also, as I said, uh, I get a lot of really uh, very nice suggestions, so I can't implement them all, but I uh, really consider doing it in, in most cases. Uh, it's probably also uh, important to keep a friendly tone. So if you've been, uh, you know, surfing on uh, uh, YouTube channels or other uh, internet pages, you see that sometimes there can be really very harsh discussions. So I'm actually happy there, uh, there don't seem to be a lot of, uh, of, of really, uh, uh, you know, harsh discussions going on, which uh, actually one thing is that I, if people reply to an comment on an old video, I don't easily see it on, on my channel. So for a few videos afterwards, by, by a coincidence, I, I went back and I saw that there were some slightly heated discussions about, you know, what's the definition of chaos and things like that. But, but still it keeps it, uh, it, it really remained at, at a very, uh, at a rather, you know, civil uh, 
the level. Uh, I mentioned these shorts, so that was also a suggestion by a viewer. So if uh, shorts are videos that are less than a minute long and they have to be in uh, either square or portrait format, so not in landscape format for some reason, which probably has to do with what pages they are, uh, they are advertised on. And uh, I, I do these occasionally, maybe once, once a week, once every two weeks, because it may help uh, attracting a different audience. Now, if you uh, follow this path of making the code yourself, one recommendation uh, is that, uh, which I've always followed, is really to make baby steps in your code. So don't try to make a very complicated simulation from the first day on. So start with something simple. Remember, I started with a billiard in a circle and then gradually add things. So really, I tried uh, taking my time in uh, developing that. And while, of course, it's also important that uh, your content should be of, of quality. So uh, one thing I uh, try to keep in mind when doing outreach, and that connects to, to something I had said just before, uh, apparently it's a Chinese proverb uh, saying that the following, so give a man a fish and he will eat for a day, teach a man how to fish and uh, he will eat for a lifetime. So I think something similar uh, happens to outreach. So explain someone uh, a mathematical result or physical phenomenon, and that person will understand the phenomenon. But what you really want to do is teach people how to think, because then uh, they will be able to think on their own and it will be much more useful to them. Okay, so just to, uh, to conclude a few future uh, projects. So one thing I plan to do is to uh, expand to some nonlinear PDEs. So I've already simulations on Alan Kahn and Fitzhumarumo equations, but there are others I've been told Keller-Segel is quite interesting, maybe uh, the Euler equation. I get questions about three dimensions. Uh, that uh, some things can be done, I think, like particle simulations in 3D. Uh, what is probably very hard is to do a uh, wave equation simulation really in 3D because it will just be very slow. But uh, okay, maybe some things are possible. Also, uh, people have been asking me for a while if I uh, could make some tutorials, uh, videos with explanations. So it's something I definitely want to do. Uh, okay, I just need the time to. Uh, to really think about uh, how, how to do that. Uh, I know I should really write a user's manual for my code. So, so far, uh, I think my code is well documented. Uh, I mean, the comments are, are fairly well written, but, but still, uh, I, I hope to find the time to do that. Uh, so far, my code is working. Uh, so it's C code with constants, and you have to change the constants and uh, compile the code to uh, uh, to make a simulation. So it would be nice to have something with a more friendly graphical user interface. So maybe I will seek some help from people who are better than me at doing that. And uh, yeah, I have a long and growing list of uh, su suggestions. So. I, I'm not in need of, you know, ideas or things to do. So, uh, well, probably I'm going to, to keep doing that for quite a while, while. And so that's a good place to stop. So let me thank you all for your attention.